Matthew chapter number 19, and we'll read the same portion of scripture that we read this morning, and to get into the second part of the message uh, tonight, Luke chapter number 19, beginning in verse number 1, uh, the Bible says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was passed that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house." And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, What is he, uh, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner? Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much that he is also a son of Abraham." For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture again tonight, Lord, that you might, that you might visit us. Lord, that you might uh, be able to occupy the open hearts. Lord, that we might be moved by your presence. Lord, that we might be touched, Lord, by your teaching. Lord, we just need to know what it is to have a fellowship, have fellowship with you. And I pray that you'd help us today, Lord, that not only would we uh, desire it, Lord, but we would know it. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at this portion of Scripture this morning, we basically got to the purpose of the how incredible it was that Zacchaeus, this man who lived in Jericho, a place of sin, knowing that, knowing that he had desperate need of help, sought Jesus. And how we are to be seeking Jesus, and what a blessing that Jesus will even visit us in Jericho. When we are at our lowest, guess who is still there desiring to receive us? Now, He did not pick Zacchaeus up and carry him out of Jericho. He just visited Jericho, giving Zacchaeus an opportunity to see him. When the opportunity became difficult, it says that he could not see him for the press because he was little of stature. Zacchaeus did not give up. And how often we give up on seeking Jesus because of the press, because of the difficulty of life, or because of the turmoil that we're in or just because we don't feel that we're worthy or whatever reason there's some press and we quit but Zacchaeus did not quit he climbed up the tree in other words he made himself a spectacle just so that he might see Jesus just so that he might see who he was we who know him should be willing to make ourselves a spectacle to know Jesus that we would be peculiar people, a royal priesthood, so that we might know Jesus more. Hey, it's great to be introduced to Jesus, but oh, to know him more. And that idea of Zacchaeus, the things that he did to to know Jesus and the passion with which we need to have to seek after Jesus as the heart panteth after the water brook, to be thirsty in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, when a, in a dry and desert land where no water is, Psalm 63, have that sort of passion for Jesus. But can I tell you that a, a, an emotional passion, a, a drive to the place was not all that took place here? I alluded it to this morning in James chapter 4, verse number 7. The Bible says, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Draw nigh unto me. Draw nigh unto God, and I will draw nigh unto thee. And we see that movement. 
we see that movement of Zacchaeus towards Jesus, but look at the response that Jesus gives him in verse number five. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. Isn't it amazing? I go all this way for Jesus, and he tells me to go a little bit further. I go all this way to see him, and he's not satisfied with just me seeing him. He wants me to get closer. He just continues. I've been, I've been, I've been a Christian for 25 years. Well, you know what Jesus' response is going to be? Well, come down and come a little bit closer. Just come a little bit closer. And so he tells him, come down and, and come, come make haste. For today I must abide at thy house. What an interesting choice of word. He does not even say, I must be a guest at thy house. I must visit thy house. He says, I must abide. Dwell. Now, he makes reference today. I, I, for, for today I must abide at thy house. And here's the thing that takes place. There's this passion, there's this drive. And to be honest, I think a lot of times we never get to the abiding because we never pursue the person of Jesus Christ. Psalm 63 says, I will follow hard after thee. And there's not this following hard after Jesus. It is is in pursuit mode. Sometimes we are following Jesus not because we are pursuing him, He just happens to be going the same way I'm going. Can I I just be honest with you? I I like having a happy home. I I like having a good marriage. I I like having uh, obedient children. I I like having uh, fellowship with with believers. I, I, I like having fun that is not filled with sin. I like all that stuff. And... And I I don't really want to abandon that. But can I tell you this? The fact that I participate in a lot of good things does not necessarily mean that Christ is abiding with me. Sometimes it's just, that's the way I'm going. That's the way, that's my culture. That's what I've been taught. That's, That's where I'm headed. And Jesus, but you know what Jesus will do? We learned this as we went through Ecclesiastes. Sometimes he'll make your way crooked, the Bible said. It says, marvel at the work of the Lord. for He's made your way crooked. See, I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying all the good things, and as long as you keep going my way, God, then I'll go your way. But when you make my way crooked, mm, I don't know if I want to continue in that. And we have to question ourselves, am I pursuing Jesus or am I just inviting Jesus along my path? Zacchaeus has this pursuit of Jesus because he knew he was in desperate need of him. And I will continue to pursue Jesus as long as I'm in desperate need of him. And so here we have this condition, Zacchaeus pursues Jesus. When you pursue Jesus, Jesus will always find you. Isn't it interesting that Jesus looked up? You say, what, don't I find Jesus? You just pursue Jesus, and he'll find you. He will find you. And Zacchaeus is pursuing Jesus, and Jesus walks. Do you think Jesus was startled by his presence? An acorn fell. Well, that's a sycamore tree. I don't know what sycamores do. A sycamore nut fell down. Whatever that is. And let, no, no, he knew exactly where he was. As I mentioned this morning, it was the first right thing that Zacchaeus had done. And Jesus noticed it. And so when he gets to that spot, he looks up at him and he says, Come down. Come down for I, today I'm going to abide at your house. Now we, we don't get all the things that happened in the house. Now it does not appear that he stopped in and just said, Hey, thanks for the coffee. I'm out of here. He abided there. Obviously, some things took place. The presence of Christ was in his home, and that presence, though it was scoffed at by the others, produced a marvelous change in the life of Zacchaeus. In fact, it completely changed his personality. What would you consider the personality 
of a publican or his traits? Benevolence? Kindness? No. Greed. That was how they made their money. He implied that of those that he had stolen from. Selfishness. But when Jesus was abiding with him, it changed his nature. It changed his person. So we have to put these two things together. We talked about this morning the necessity that we need to have for continuing to pursue the person of Jesus, not on a yearly basis, but on a moment-by-moment basis, a passion for the person of Jesus. And I must seek after Jesus. But in response to that, Christ's response is not to become someone that you are acquainted with, He doesn't want to become an acquaintance with you. He wants to abide with you. And this continual abiding is necessary to keep the fellowship that we're supposed to have, to keep our steps of obedience not only going the right way, but having with those steps the proper motive so that I can receive the reward for Him in heaven I need not only to him to direct my way, I need to have his presence pursuing the person of Jesus and the abiding that needs to take place. In this abiding, it tells us this, as he says in verse number five, I must abide at that house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. We are, um, let me make sure I say this properly. It appears so often, and maybe I just maybe I've seen evidence of this, of this in my life, and certainly in American Christianity, we appear very much to be a Laodicean type atmosphere here in America. Now, no doubt, you can go to some other parts of the world, and some underground church in China or in India or some place like that, and they're going to say, "What? We don't have that same attitude towards Christ." But we have seen it much in America. And there in Revelation 3, when it talks about that Laodicean church, it pictures Christ standing outside the door. If any man, in essence, will receive me, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. And there's obviously something else that we are passionate about that we could overlook the knocking. Or maybe it's this, as I um, can't remember, I, I was reading a book, read lots of books. I was reading a book and the, this pastor was meeting with somebody and they were talking about their youth group and they said this, they said, listen, listen, all we want you to do is mix in a little Jesus every once in a while. We don't want him to be the purpose We just want him to be a stopping place along the tour. And when we read that, that, that's horrible for a youth group. I agree with you. But that's the way the Laodicean church lived. And sometimes in our own life, he's just, he's part of the, he's part of the scenery, but he's not the purpose of my life. The Bible tells us there in Colossians, Christ who is my life. So we're talking about this abiding, and abiding will produce change. Zacchaeus was abiding with Christ, and it produced change. We know from the uh, book of John, chapter number 15, let's turn there. We've looked at this before, but it's just, I think we need to be reminded how these two need to go together. Because you'll never get to the place where Christ is abiding with you if you are not continually having a passion to pursue him and pursue him. But John chapter number 15 says, I am the true vine and the father is a husband and every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges and that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as branches cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me life spiritual life continues by abiding in the person of christ years ago we were living in lutz 
when we worked at uh, Faith Baptist Church, and in the backyard, we had, um, honey, what were those trees? Maple trees. And uh, maple acorns would fall from those trees. Uh, we had maple trees in the backyard. What, and we had a swamp out uh, beyond our property a little bit. And what I did not know is apparently maple trees have this ability that when the ground is wet, they will just soak up as much water as they can. Soak up as much water as they can. And, and they just kind of swell a little bit. But then when things become to be a drought that maple tree does not take in enough um, moisture to feed its branches. And therefore, maple trees are known for their branches just falling off at unknown times. When you would look at the branch, it looks okay, but it has not been nourished by the vine, so it would fall off. We had these large maple trees in our backyard. Large maple trees. And uh, Caden was out back. He was probably, I don't know, four years old. And he's bouncing on the trampoline. And all of a sudden, was I home? I don't think I was home probably. Uh, They heard this huge crash. And this maple tree branch that was about that big around from about 20 feet up just fell out of nowhere. Landed on the ground and it was falling down and luckily it hit the house. It put a big hole in the roof and just, I mean, just made lots of damage. Just fell for no reason at all. Caden was a little bit terrified terrified, because he's screaming with the house shook. Leona's running outside and he's like, you know. It was amazing. It bent the trampoline, hit the trampoline, bent the trampoline. It's probably 10 feet from Caden. And just dropped out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. You're like, why in that? We were like, what in the world was that? So we talked to somebody that knew something about maple trees, and he said they have a tendency to soak up so much water when things are good, but when things are bad, they have become so overwhelmed, so heavy, that they literally fall. And there is this continual pooling of force i.e. gravity in the weight of the branch, is continually pulling it naturally away from the trunk. And because it has not been nourished continually, though it appears to be okay on the outside, it has gone rotten on the inside. And without anybody knowing or seeing, it falls. And I think a lot of times as believers, we go, hey, look at me, I look okay. I'm doing all right. But without that continual abiding, we find ourselves being pulled by forces away from the person of Christ. And with just the right wind, and with just the right weight, we go crashing down. And I think sometimes we are not anticipating the battle. Can I ask you, this week when you woke up, Now, some of you, bless God, you probably did this, and and bless God for you. But I can tell you, there are days that go by, and if you were to ask me, hey, did you engage in the battle today? I'd have said, what battle? I did what I had to do, did the things I was supposed to do, and what, what battle are you talking about? There's a battle going on. There are forces that are pulling down against the branches desirous that they would not be able to bear fruit and desirous that they would break off of the vine. And friends, sometimes when things are going good, man, I can get pretty swelled up. Not just physically. (laughs) But I can get pretty swelled up on the blessings of God and the the good things and I walk around and man, isn't life good? Bless God, man, everything's awesome. But what about when the drought comes? What about in the drought? The only thing that will keep that branch healthy is if it continually is fed by the vine. Now, in John 15, going into chapter number 16, 
he's making a very clear reference to this continually abiding is found in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's where it's found. He says, I must needs leave you, but I will send another and he will guide you into all truth. And he is called the comforter. And the Holy Spirit is the ability for me to get continually nurtured by the vine. Friend, I was grafted in, even as, a, even as a Gentile, the book of Romans tells me, I was grafted into that natural tree, and what a blessing it is that I can be part of the family of God. But even as a child of God, I must continually be fed by the Spirit. And it is this desire to have the presence of Christ and abiding with Christ that's going to be able to produce in me the kind of change that's going to bring glory to Christ. And that's what he expects in my life. Change that brings glory to Christ. So it reminds me if we go back to Luke chapter number 11. I preached on this passage when we were going through the book of Luke. On chapter number 11. And I tell you, I cannot get it out of my head. Because this goes along with the passion that Zacchaeus displayed to see the person of Christ. There is this passion and pursuit in this particular arena that must be displayed so that we can continually be filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and yielding to the things of the Spirit. Luke chapter number 11 Beginning in verse number 6, the Bible says this. For a friend of mine, oh, let's start in verse number 5. And he say unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in his journey, has come, come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot arise and give thee. And I say unto you, though he will not arise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. For a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give unto him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give a fish? Uh, will he give him a serpent? If he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? Now we see Zacchaeus pursuing the person of Christ. And there's this passion for the person of Christ. But the abiding, the continual abiding, is also a pursuit that is found in the prayer closet that produces in my life presence with the Holy Spirit and fill, being filled with the Holy Spirit and the Lord giving unto me the Holy Ghost. Say, preacher, didn't you get the Holy Ghost when you were saved? You bet I did but I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Oftentimes on our Thursday Bible study, Brother Brock had made, has made this statement. He said, I think as Christians, we have forgotten the ministry of the Holy Ghost. And I agree with that, and I would say this. I think as Christians, we've forgotten what it is to ask for the ministry of the Holy Ghost. It is biblical in Acts chapter number 2. Before the day of Pentecost, what did they do? They continued in prayer steadfastly. And they received the Holy Ghost. Then Peter stands up and preaches on the day of Pentecost. We see it in the New Testament over and over again. They continued in prayer. So I made some statements this morning about having a passion for the person of Christ, pursuing the person of Christ, in essence, climbing out on the tree limb so that you can see Jesus. Don't you love it when a preacher preaches something and doesn't tell you how to do it? You're like, man, that sounds good. How do I do that? 
I don't think any of you got out this morning or this afternoon after I preached that and ran down Mariner looking for Jesus. You didn't go climb any sycamore trees, did you? I don't even know what one would look like. Don't climb a maple tree. <laughs> Branches may fall down. So how do we do it? A pursuit of the person of Christ begins by pursuing him in prayer. That's where it begins. And this kind of prayer, as we have mentioned in Luke chapter number 18, this kind of prayer is not a casual prayer. This kind of prayer is not a ritualistic prayer. This kind of prayer is not a repetitive prayer by vain repetition of some model prayer. This prayer is a prayer that says, Lord, I will pursue you and I will seek you until you are found. Until you're found. Now, lest I be accused of some false doctrine, let me just clear something up. Years ago, there was a false doctrine. I believe it's a false doctrine, uh, as I would see it, of this idea of praying through. Anybody ever heard of praying through? Praying through had this idea. It was you would continue to pray and continue to pray and continue to pray. And by the sheer continuance of your prayer, God was therefore then obligated at some point to answer your prayer. And they would preach all the way around it in different ways of looking at it and everything. But it was something you just got to pray through. And to be honest with you, I think they took a Bible principle and just twisted it because the bible over and over says the necessity of pray without ceasing prayer of importunity to continually seek god's face but it's so that we might receive instead of something in this passage in luke chapter number 11 what is received the holy ghost the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to, here we go. I'm going to get Baptocostal on you right here. Here we go. As sometimes as Baptists, we are, you know what? Sometimes we have forsaken the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we've also forsaken the area of if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, it shouldn't affect my face. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm an independent, fundamental, King James, loving, devil hating Baptist. Can't you tell how joyful I am? Can I tell you this? When I was pursuing my wife, and I wanted to ask her hand in marriage, once eventually that day took place in 1995, I remember, 1995. I did not stand at the altar and go, she is finally mine. No, I was excited about it, friend. I was happy. I'm standing up there, she's walking down the aisle, I'm like, woo! <laughs> yes, it's awesome. Man, I was excited. I was fidgety and everything, you know, and I was all happy. After the reception, I'm high fiving people. Yes, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> And some person, you could see him over the corner going, purely, this is all emotionalism. <laughs> this is simply emotionalism. No, 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 no. It wasn't emotionalism. It was a passion for a person that produced a type of countenance upon my face. Now, I would agree with you that if you're desirous to produce a passion in your face by making some sort of countenance, you got it all backwards which is sometimes what can be done. But friend, when you know that Christ has forgiven you and cleansed you, when you know that as you have prayed to Him, He has heard you and filled you, and you go, eh, I'm filled with the Spirit. It's kind of neat. Aren't you allowed to be excited about that? Aren't you allowed to be passionate about that? And I think sometimes we have quailed the passion to match 
the presence. We have, we have pushed back the passion. Now, don't get excited here, folks. We've pushed back the passion to match the presence. Yeah, have you ever been with somebody that they were witnessing so much that it almost made you feel uncomfortable? I have. I have. I was with this preacher, and he was walking up to people and saying, let me tell you about my Jesus. You know, he's telling them about Jesus, and I was going, okay, um... I, I, was, I felt a little strange. Now, I'm not saying you go out and do it the wrong way. He was, he was actually just being joyful. He wasn't doing anything wrong. And I was sitting there, and I, was, I felt like the Lord was saying, is it just possible that he's so excited about me he can't help but tell him? Is it just possible that because he spent such time with me and he's had the cleansing of my forgiving blood... And because he knows he's filled with the Spirit, he can't help but release the fire that's in his bones. And maybe your lack of passion is just being honest with the condition of your presence. So how do I gain that passion? Well, if you want to gain gain passion... For the person of Christ, you must spend time with the person of Christ. There must be some abiding. And how does that begin? It begins by those of us that are lower. Friend, we are lower than the person of Christ. Humbling ourselves. Abasing ourselves on our knees before God. And saying, Christ, Lord I need you. I need you. I want to abide with you. I want you to abide with me. I want to know your presence. See, preacher, how do you know you have that kind of presence? Well, can I tell you how Zacchaeus knew? It changed his nature. You guys ever struggle with anything that is just who you are? You know? You struggle with grumpiness because that's just who you are. You struggle with anger because that's just who you are. You struggle with uh, uh, unkindness or lack of caring or hurtful sarcasm because that's just who you are. But is that who Jesus is? No, it's not who Jesus is. I know I'm supposed to do better, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but you know you spent time with Jesus when he changes who you are. My wife can attest to this, that one of the areas that the Lord has given me victory over because I have spent time being convicted and praying about this was I was so competitive, angry competitive. I remember getting to an altercation with my boss who was the pastor of the church because I didn't like the call he made in a volleyball game. Right there in front of everybody. So angry. I remember the time I got so angry at the softball field and threw my glove and all these people are watching, saved and unsaved in the whole world. And one of the youth group members came up to me and says, now when you talk to us about keeping our temper, is that what you're talking about? <laughs> Luckily, there was a fence between us. I mean, just, mm. And through some of those things, the Lord convicted me and said, that's not who I am. My first response is, yeah, but that's who I am. Well, then who you want to be like. And after some time in prayer and just saying, God, please, I need you. I need you. Can I tell you, by God's grace, he's given me victory. Now, I love playing competition against competitive people. Just to see them melt is the most wonderful thing in the world. I used to be like you. It's just amazing. Now, that's one area of victory, but... I mean, if you would ask people how much I've changed in that area, I'm telling you, it's because of the person of Christ. And still changing. Oh, it's over here making fun of me. I need to abide in Christ so that he can make me into who he is. 
these verses that have just been penetrating my heart recently. You know, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but let each esteem other better than himself. And how do you do that? Christ abiding in you. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. And think about the verse, rejoice in the Lord always. How do you do that? Abiding in Christ. Be anxious for nothing. I mean, how's that possible? Abiding in Christ. So when the standard is to be like the person of Christ, the Bible tells us in the book of James that he is our example, then man, how much I need him. But my passion can only be measured by my time spent in prayer and my effort spent in prayer asking for the filling of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God in my life and surrendering all the things that he brings up. Surrendering all the things that he brings up. You know why young people don't normally ask this question? I've never had Jackson ask this question. Hey, Dad, could you tell me some things that I could work on? You know why probably he doesn't ask that question? I have a list. If he asked me that question, I would have some things that I could tell him. That's part of the problem with our prayer life. We never spend the time letting God speak to us about those things that he has to clean out and clean away and truly wanting to be like him. So there's never any abiding that takes place and it doesn't produce change and we just continue on this circle of mediocrity of not really having a life that is sold out for Christ but we don't want to be sold out for the world either. We know that's wrong and there's not a passion for the person of Christ and he does not, he is not our life. Zacchaeus, when he abided with Christ, it changed him. It changed him. And I wonder if there's just a lack of pursuit in prayer for the person of Christ. A lack of pursuit by saying, Christ, dear Lord, I need you. And I will continue to continue to ask you to help show me what I need to get rid of in my life. To clean things out of my life so that I can be an empty vessel that will be used for you. Because sometimes you need to go back again to get cleaned again. My wife, she's amazing how she can clean things. But she'll go into the kitchen, there'll be a pot with stuff on it. Man, it's just grime on it. And I'll go in there and I'll go and look at that, take a rag. That's not coming off. <laughs> Flavor for next time. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, she's like, you got to get that clean. I'm like, I tried, it doesn't come clean. How do we do it? She says, keep scrubbing. Keep scrubbing. Let it soak and keep scrubbing. You mean you want it all to be gone? Yes. You know what eventually happens when she cleans the dishes? It's all gone. It's amazing. And sometimes as believers, we don't spend enough time in prayer so that the, lo- the, that the Lord can spend any time scrubbing. He comes in, he does a little scrubbing. That's enough. That's enough. No more. And the Lord says, listen, I want to clean you. I want to have a clean vessel to dwell in. So why don't you come spend some time with me? Let me clean you. Let me bring up some things in your heart and mind that perhaps you have forgotten that are there, but it's stopping us from having the kind of fellowship we're supposed to have. Zacchaeus was changed not just because he saw Christ, but Christ abided with him. I wonder if part of the problems in our homes is we spend lots of times, we spend lots of time pointing out Christ to our children. Oh, look, there he is. Did you see him? There he is. Did you hear that message? There he is. Did you see that person? There he is. We spend a lot of time pointing Jesus out and not near enough time abiding with him and spending time in prayer 
and letting our kids and our wife and ourselves see what it is to pursue the person of God through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you, are you abiding in Christ? Is He changing you? Is He changing who you are into what He is? Preacher, I'm trying. I'm trying. Me too. But sometimes I find myself staying down, just pushing against the press instead of getting so close that He's coming over to my house and abiding with me and changing me. And it develops a greater passion for Him so that I cannot help but share the good news of Christ with the people I come in contact with. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, how we are in such need of you. Lord, we as busy people clamored about with much. We have developed often the Martha syndrome that we are so busy with the things that are going on. Some of them trivial, some of them spiritual that we do not often take time and choose the better thing. To simply sit at the feet of Jesus. Spend time in prayer. And to be able to have such a passion for you and that you would respond to that and draw nigh to us that your presence in our life produces drastic change change in our countenance change in our conduct change in our conversation our ambitions our dreams the way we look at life Lord I pray that you'd help us that we would pursue you in such a way so that you might be able to abide in us Lord, I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name.